Are we all happy to be in church today? Okay. Well, my name is Kenny, and I have two kids. I received a 30-minute appraisal after the first service, so I need to do this right. I've got two kids, Davida and Seth, and I've got a a wonderful husband, Matt, who is serving in the foyer. Now, I'm part of Discovery Kids, and what we do... Woo! It's, I'm part of the kids' ministry, and I, I do teach. And as part of that, I, there was a service that I had to teach a particular story. And it's about the woman at the well. Now, that particular story is quite difficult to teach kids because certain things don't really... They don't re- they, well, they get it, but it's different from, for them. We're talking about different times. So, um, when I got the message to do the teach today, um, this story just came to my head, this encounter, and I was like, God, no, not this one. I don't like it. (laughs) I just couldn't get rid of it. I tried, you know. I said, maybe it will be this, maybe it will be that, but I guess the Holy Spirit was trying to teach me something, and I did learn, you know, preparing, and I'm hoping that everyone in this room leaves with something that the Holy Spirit is going to sow. So um, the encounter today is from John 4, mainly from 4 to 42. And it's about the woman at the well. We never get to know what her name is, but it is such a powerful story. Now, just a bit of background. At the start of chapter 4, Jesus is informed that the Pharisees have heard that he's baptizing so many people, And Jesus really wanted to return back to Galilee from Judea. And verse 4 of chapter 4 says, Now he had to go through Samaria. There were other ways to get to Galilee, but the Bible says he had to go. There was some urgency. It was intentional, and he had a purpose. Now, So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired as he was from the journey. He sat down by the well. It was about noon. So he's tired, and he's resting in this town. Now, a lot of Jews would rather go through other routes. They would avoid Samaria. Just because the Samaritans and the Jews, they didn't really get along. They didn't like each other. The Jews were meant to be better. But Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now the story sort of changes. It focuses on the Samaritan woman. Now the Samaritan woman comes up to the well at the hottest time of the day. Now this woman has done this deliberately. She is cut off socially from everyone. She probably decides that it's easier for me to walk through the desert in the heat, carrying my water, than to face everything that was said about me. So she decides, she makes this plan to avoid it, but Jesus finds her. So she gets to the well and she sees Jesus, knowing Jesus is a Jew. Now, I understand where she's coming from because sometimes maybe you're going shopping and you're going down an aisle and you see someone you recognize and you quickly pivot, hoping the person doesn't catch you. You know, we've all done it. I put my hand up. We have. Anybody like me? Or you sat for five more minutes, just avoid someone in the parking lot. We all do that. But hers was of great urgency to her. It was emotional. It wasn't just, oh, I can't spend five minutes talking to that person. So she meets Jesus. She feels it's okay. So she keeps going because Jesus is a Jew. He's not going to talk to her. But then we find out in verse 7 that when a Samaritan woman comes to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The woman, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Now, it's strange to her, but this is at this point she realizes, she learns the truth of who Jesus is. 
So he answers, Jesus answers in chapter, um, verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He offers her this gift, water. And she says, sir, the, the, sir, the woman says, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where will you get this living water? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And straight away, she jumps at it. The woman said to him, sir, give me the water so I don't get thirsty again. I don't have to come here and draw water. She's ready to receive the gift, but all she sees are all the physical issues she has in her life. But he's offering much more. In Philippians 4.19, the word of God says, my God will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. It's not just the physical. You need a new car. You need money to pay for this. God is there for you in both spirit and also in the physical. But for her at this point in time, he wasn't stopping her from having to walk in the afternoon to get water. It's much more. His gift of transformation is what he was offering her. So he ignores her and continues on. He wants, to see, he wants her to see who he really is. So he asked for her husband, and she says, oh, I don't have a husband. And then he said, well, you've had five. You're with a partner right now, and he's not your husband. And she knows that he is indeed. He must be a prophet. He must be someone who knows, who's gifted. And it's at that point when I say that during DK, the kids look at me, I'm like, so? Um, so she receives redemption. The conversation moves on because she's starting to un pick up all the layers. She's unpicking and understanding who this person is before her. He's a Jew. He might be a prophet because he sees her. He's talking to her, a woman, a Samaritan woman. And he isn't acting like everyone else does to her. He's being compassionate. He's not using her history against her. So they move the conversation on to worship. I think she's probably testing him here. So the Jews say you should worship in Jerusalem. We say we, you, sh uh, you should worship on the mountain. What's the right one? And in verse 23, the Bible says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Verse 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now, this is a pivotal moment in her life because not only has she been seen but she is in the presence of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it's amazing because this woman at the start of the story would rather suffer in the heat than encounter anyone. It's possible that women won't let their husbands near her because she's obviously gotten five in the past. We don't know how she got it. But this woman, as she meets Jesus, she runs out. She's no longer avoiding people. She's drawing people in. Verse 28 says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. 39. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the one's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. Now, Jesus, at the very beginning, had a sense of urgency. It wasn't necessarily to run to Galilee. 
he had an appointment, and that's the appointment he's made. He was touching lives. Now, verse 34 says, And because of his words, many more became believers. 42, they said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Amazing. Now, there's something we do in Discovery Kids. We do play, we read the scripture, we sing, but we always have a need to know. And that's the one thing. Even if you're going to forget anything else, don't forget this. And this is your need to know today. The first is that you are loved and you're worthy. The love of God knows no bounds. He saw the woman. He knew everything she had done. Nothing was new, but he still loved her. And it's clear in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isaiah 43 verse 4 says, You are precious to me. I give you honor and I love you. The second is you are accepted. Come as you are. Jesus is not asking for much more. He will use you whichever way and whatever. It doesn't matter what history you have. Your history is important because there's value in it. Um, John 14, 15 says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends for everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. And we are redeemed. We are redeemed. We are the redeemed of the Lord. John 8, verse 31 and 32, so it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, I, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Romans 8, verse 30. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And we are transformed. We should never let it stop with us. God has given us a gift. It doesn't have to be singing. It doesn't have to be able to dance. You know, we've got so many ways in which we can serve. But there's a gift in us. Now, last week, we learned from Ezra when she talked about the encounter with Moses. Come as you are. You don't need any sort of skills. God will use you. Now, Ephesians 2, verse 10 says, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. And I'll stop there. I would like you to all remember that, just like that woman who saw herself as unworthy, who was ashamed, God is there. He's waiting to meet us. And whichever part of the journey you're at, he's there with you. You might have been at the point where you don't, you don't know the love of God. This is the starting point. You can experience that love. He loves you. He will accept you. You know, and you will be transformed. And in whatever way you find, spread that love on. You know, take your um, journal of thankfulness. I think it was Sean that talked about that. Or jar of miracles. And use every memory that God has stood in the gap for you as a testimony and touch someone's life. Thank you.